Good evening, Philippines. Good afternoon. Good morning, world. In whichever time zone you guys are watching us from, welcome to season three, episode one of the English Blog. We are a blog of English teachers by English teachers and for English teachers. My name is Adrian. I'm Christine. And I'm Sarah. And today we are watching uh, season three, episode one, emotional intelligence. So if you would like to um, develop emotional intelligence as a teacher or as a person, then this episode is just for you. So we provide customized lesson plan making services, life and career coaching sessions, weekly blog and blog content related to ESL education. So you can send us a message through our website, theenglishblog.com, or also in the social media accounts that Sarah is going to share with you right now. So you can find the English blog all across social media. We're most active on Facebook where you can find us under the page name, The English Blog, but the URL is The English Blog for Teachers. Um, that's where we post all of these videos first. You can also find us on Instagram at the underscore English underscore blog. We're also on LinkedIn, and we do have a YouTube channel where we post our videos after they come out on Facebook. Um, we don't have an official fancy URL for that, so it's on the slide. It's a series of letters and numbers. Um, you can also find us on Twitter at the English blog one, uh, wherever you want to, you can like, follow, share, subscribe, and talk to us across all of these platforms. We would love to hear from you. Okay. So as you guys watch us in this video, please don't forget to share it because sharing is caring. And here goes the first question. What's the difference between EQ and IQ? which is more important for success. So for me, the way I connect this is that EQ has something to do with, um, as you know, that's emotional quotient and IQ is intelligence quotient. For me, EQ has something to do with values and how you apply your uh, knowledge, whereas IQ is competence and that's the technicalities. Now, Here's the difference between the two. So IQ is the brain, whereas EQ is the heart. And IQ is the ability to apply knowledge, whereas emotional quotient is the ability to adjust. IQ, as research say, uh, it's fixed level. You're born with it and whatever IQ you have, it's fixed for all your life. Whereas EQ can be learned, it's flexible. IQ may get your food in the door, but EQ determines how far you could go. And this is also based on research, saying that IQ determines 20 to 25% of business success, while EQ determines 75 to 80% of business success. And some of you guys may be familiar with the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule, 80% 80 is EQ and 20% is IQ. What do you think about this, Christine? Yeah, I completely agree with you on those differences. Um, but they also have similarities. And one similarity um, that we have between EQ and IQ is that they can both be learned. And just as people can increase their IQ through a variety of ways, like memory activities, um, continued education, frequent reading, people can also improve their EQ through, for example, developing active listening skills, practicing self-awareness, empathizing with other people, utilizing leadership skills. Um, although I would say that people are born with a certain level of EQ or IQ, um, those are also qualities that can be developed over time, as I mentioned before. What are the indicators of emotional intelligence or a lack thereof. So emotional intelligence was really developed by a psychologist called Daniel Goleman, who wrote not many, many books about emotional intelligence and how to use it. And he proposes kind of five key, I guess, facets, but in a way they are 
indicators. If you have these things, you have high EQ. Um, so those five are, they're divided into internal and external uh, indicators. So the internal ones are self-awareness, self-regulation, and intrinsic or like self-motivation. The external ones are social skills and empathy. Um, this is what Daniel Goleman said, so I'm going to take his word for it because he's studied it in the lab much more than I have. Um, I would just like to say that as somebody who is reading this and studying about EQ and curious to learn more, I think that a word that I really like that encompasses it is authenticity, especially for those self ones. I think that you have self-awareness, self-regulation, and intrinsic motivation. They depend on you being, on knowing who your authentic self is and being that person. That's, that's where you, you do all of this EQ well. So to me, that would be a huge indicator of a person's EQ. Are they sincere? Are they authentic? Do they know who they are? Are they happy with who they are? And are they showing me who they are? That I think would be a really high indicator. Um, and then your social skills are, those are probably the ones where you notice the most when somebody doesn't have them. Um, and things just get a little rocky and bumpy. And a lot of the times when the, there's some social skill or social grace lacking, um, sometimes it's because really a, a problem with empathy. They're not, the person you're interacting with isn't imagining how you feel or trying to have an interaction with you. It's just me expressing myself instead of me understanding the feelings of other people in the room, the thoughts. Um, so yeah, I would say those are the five indicators, self-awareness, self-regulation, intrinsic motivation, social skills, and empathy. Adrian, do you have any that you want to add? I really like what Sarah mentioned about um, authenticity. For me, as someone who's trained with emotional intelligence, um, authenticity is the crown jewel of emotional intelligence. And what I learned from uh, the certification process is that authenticity doesn't only mean that you're genuine, but it also encompasses that you are able to keep your word, your promises, and uh, I also would like to share something in relation to this, what Brene Brown mentioned about being vulnerable and authentic. Um, you have to do that in the right time and place and with the right people, because not everyone um, is, in, is entitled to hear your story. Not everyone can hold that space with you. So I'm gonna share with you a few slides, with you guys a few slides uh, based on partly what Sarah mentioned earlier. So this is uh, one of the iterations of the Daniel Goleman framework um, of emotional intelligence. You have on the left side self and then on the right side social and you have self-awareness, social awareness, self-management, social skills. And you see there uh, how you recognize who you are the regulation, what you do. This is one of the three models that I'm gonna share with you in this vlog. Here's another one, and this is by Mark Brackett, um, who's a research psychologist and professor at Yale. He uh, used the acronym RULER. First is recognizing emotions in self and others. U is understanding the causes and consequences of emotions. L is labeling emotions accurately, E is expressing emotions appropriately, and R is regulating emotions effectively. This is some of the stuff that Sarah mentioned earlier, and this is in the Genus Gener International Framework of, for which I'm certified as a trainer. You have self-awareness up on top, awareness of others, authenticity, emotional reasoning, self-management and positive influence. And for me, it's like a ladder. The very bottom of the ladder is self-awareness and you go up and the goal really is for you to become a positive influence. And in order for you to, have, to be genuinely positively influencing your students and your co-teachers at school, you have to, to have all those components going up or else your 
positivity or your influence will not be as sufficient or would, wouldn't be as empowering if you didn't go through all of those ladders before the positive influence part. Now, what are some common misconceptions? Um, well, one huge misconception that people have is that charisma equates with having a high EQ. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. Um, there are people who have charisma and charm, but they lack emotional empathy. And I'm aware of two different types of empathy. There's cognitive empathy, which is the ability to understand and recognize people's feelings and emotions. And then there's emotional empathy, which is the ability to share people's feelings and emotions. And um, a great example of people who have, um, I guess, a low level of emotional empathy, which I think is very important for EQ, is people with high levels of psychopathy. And um, many of them have been known to have high levels of cognitive empathy, but very low levels of emotional empathy. And that's not to mention that they have been known to be charming and um, I guess on the surface look like they can easily connect with other people. Um, so I'm bringing that point up because if having a lot of charisma meant having a high EQ, then we could argue that many psychopaths or serial killers have an, a high EQ and we know that that could not be farther from the truth. So I think that having a good combination of cognitive empathy and emotional empathy, but especially emotional empathy um, is very important for having a high level of emotional intelligence. There are some other misconceptions, uh, slightly different and some related to what Christine said. Besides charisma, I think sometimes people erroneously equate EQ with IQ. Just because you have a high IQ doesn't mean you have a high EQ. And just because you have a high EQ doesn't mean you have a high IQ either. Um, and kind of in order to, to, to be, to be, you need both. And as Adrian said, you need both in different ratios, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, and for us as teachers, you definitely need more EQ than you need IQ. Um, and your job is to help everyone around you, yourself, fellow teachers, and importantly, your students to develop their EQ because it's ultimately gonna make them better language learners and language teachers. Um, the other, so that's why I think it's important to remember that it is, it can be developed, that it's always in flux, it's always growing. Uh, it's like a muscle, the more you use it, the stronger it gets, and the more stuff you can do, the farther you can stretch yourself and other people. Um, and I think that because sometimes people think it's fixed, they get a little bit sexist about EQ as well, and they think that women have a naturally higher EQ or that EQ is all about being emotional and just being like in touch with your feelings, which if being in touch with your feelings means self-aware, then yes, you need, <laughs> you need to be in touch with yourself. If in touch with your feelings means you can't control your emotions and you're all over the place and like we looked at the frameworks, you're not correctly identifying emotions or communicating emotions. No, you, you aren't in touch with yourself and you don't have a high IQ. EQ. Um, so yeah, I think it's really important that people remember that it's not fixed and that everybody, men and women, can equally develop their EQ. I think that people run into women who generally have a higher EQ or better social skills. And it has less to do with women's physiology and more to do with the social settings in which women are taught to interact from birth into the future. Uh, you're always looking out for other people. You're always trying to make other people's lives better. And how do you do that? By knowing what their lives are. So although maybe girls and women have a kind of edge, curse and a blessing, um, it doesn't mean that, that they can't improve. It doesn't mean that men can't have a high EQ. And you can find all sorts of people with high EQ and low EQ. And it's really a spectrum. And the key is the more that you practice it, the better you get. And as you're increasing your EQ is going to have a positive effect. It doesn't depend on other people. You don't need everybody in the room to have a sky high EQ. 
If you increase your EQ, you're going to increase the goodness in the room, regardless of what the other people do. Amen. Amen to that, Sarah. All right. How can you model or mentor emotional intelligence in the classroom? For me, um, I think the number one value or principle that we need to learn, not only as teachers, but eventually as parents for you, for, in terms of Sarah and myself, um, is that values are more caught than taught. And that means it is incumbent for teachers to actually um, model emotional intelligence in the classroom and how do you do that for me it's also letting letting a part of your vulnerability show up in the classroom meaning don't be afraid to to let them see uh some of your weak areas um let them let them in to some of your personal stuff not all okay again you have to be you have to set proper boundaries you have to tell some stuff in the right place and time and with the right people so it's very important for students to also know their teacher beyond the classroom what their lives are like and what makes them cry what makes them happy so that the students would also feel comfortable sharing their own um, weaknesses in the classroom because it's gonna show up no matter what happens it's gonna show up for sure and if we're if if uh, the teacher is not comfortable sharing his or her own weaknesses it will be very difficult for the students to be vulnerable and to feel safe in that learning environment um, so exactly I completely agree with Adrian you need to bring yourself authentically to your classroom and you need to be yourself. Um, and then I find as a language teacher and a language learner, I often share very embarrassing or crazy mistakes I've made in my own language learning process. That's as if you're somebody who has also learned another language, a foreign language, it can be really beneficial. Just connect with them on that level and then the next step is to show that connection, share that connection. Say, I know exactly how you feel because I made a worse mistake. <laughs> um, it's specifically for language teachers. And then I teach mostly children and specifically mostly middle and high schoolers. So like adolescents, which is a really interesting time for people to be developing their EQ and I think it's very important that if you want to help instill EQ and all of these skills in children, the root of it, I really do think is self-esteem and self-identity and self-awareness. Um, and so I think it's very important to help instill confidence in, in these kids um, so that they feel confident to explore different aspects of themselves, to start building their identity um, and so that they're not afraid to make mistakes. And I think that really is the root, just like you see in school, the, the kids that bully the other kids, it's because they're insecure. They, they're, not, they're not content within themselves. Um, and I think that, especially in children, if they have that anxiety and that discontent with who they are or who they think they are, or their place in the world, it makes it very difficult for them to learn either more of these EQ skills or to learn a language, to be honest with you. They really need to, that's an important base layer that you should not forget about when teaching children, certainly. Yep, what do you think about that, Christine? About the question, how do you model emotional intelligence in the classroom? Well, I found some research from Dr. Schottman, who is a psychological researcher, and um, he came up with five steps to emotion coaching. And although this was originally meant for parents and their children, it can definitely be used in the classroom. And um, especially since a big part of language teaching is naming and identifying emotions. So the first one is being aware of your students' emotions. Know how they are feeling. Um, and then 
when you when you can identify what they are feeling, see those emotions as an opportunity to connect with your students. So that's step two. And then step three, um, in that process, try to listen and validate their feelings. Um, so the fourth step is to label their emotions, like what you are feeling is sadness, what you are feeling is embarrassment or shame, um, happiness, excitement. Um, try to give them words for all the things that they are feeling. And then the fifth and last step um, is to help them problem solve. And um, one disclaimer that I have is that although there might, well, there might be some cultural obstacles because in some cultures, um, students or people are a bit hesitant to express themselves e emotionally. So that's, that's a potential challenge that you have to be aware of. But yeah, these are, again, these were intended for parents, but they can be used as well in the classroom with your students and with anybody really. Yeah, that's true because as they say, teachers are the second parents of students at school, right? Explain the importance of emotional intelligence for teachers, especially language teachers. Um, you really need it to communicate, to communicate with other teachers, with administration in your school, uh, with students, with parents. You, it'll help you just express yourself understand other people better and come up with solutions that work for your students because ultimately that's everybody's goal and i think sometimes in those school environments people can lose sight of that and get a little too focused on their own personal feelings or whatever they are obsessed with at that moment that they want to drive home so i think having high eq helps you reach compromise and make an effective learning curriculum environment for the students, which is the main goal. Um, the other thing that I think it's really important for is within your classroom, language learning can be really, really vulnerable, um, especially for adults who are used to being so good at everything else in their life. <laughs> and that can be a real struggle to get adults back into that mode where it's okay to make mistakes we're, you're all here to learn. Like just because you mix up a verb tense doesn't make you a failure of, a, of an adult. It doesn't make you any less of an adult or capable human being. Um, and I think EQ can really, is really critical for reaching adults and a lot of children too, who are a little bit nervous and anxious. Um, but I, as I teach, I've taught adults and children and it is a stark difference between you kind of almost have to do, it's different EQ work, working with kids and working with adults. And with the adults, you really have to almost lure them into a place of vulnerability and uh, willingness to be imaginative, creative, and make all these kinds of mistakes because they really are going beyond themselves. Um, so having EQ can help your students feel more comfortable doing those things. And then the other thing that I really do want to touch on is that in any language and in English, EQ is kind of central to the language itself. That's why we have languages, is to connect with people and communicate with people. And so much of every language, including English, is all kinds of language focused on building emotional intelligence. All, our, all, all these being polite words. There's a difference between could you open the window and can you open the window? So, I think that's also critical to the language itself. And you can't not teach EQ and teach English. They have to be taught together because that is the point of English. How can teachers increase their emotional intelligence? Any suggested readings? Okay. So I think that to enhance your emotional intelligence, my greatest advice is from Socrates, who often gives good advice, uh, which is know thyself. That is the root of EQ, is to know yourself, know how you're feeling, know who you are, know what you stand for, know what you wanna do, what you wanna be in the world, know your gifts, know your struggles, 
know your story. Um, and once you do that and you really start building that self-awareness, you can start to look at yourself and who you are and who you know is yourself. And you can start to make adjustments to your behavior. You can analyze yourself and find the patterns of poor communication skills that you make. Um, maybe you interrupt each other all the time. Then what you do is you give yourself the challenge. I wanna go and have this conversation with this kind of difficult person. And I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna listen. That's just what I'm gonna challenge myself to do. Um, so yeah, you need to start with some self-awareness and some self-reflection, and then identify these areas um, that you could increase your EQ with, um, figure out what could be improved, and then think of a way to improve it. So maybe it's like Christine said earlier in this video, practicing some active listening, not interrupting. Maybe sometimes you say some like negative things or you self-deprecate yourself. Um, or other people, that would be a great thing that you can try to just be aware of and eventually change that behavior. But you can't change behavior unless you know it's what you're doing. Uh, and that changing it is what you want to do. So I think first you got to start there. Um, he has a lot of books and I highly recommend them. So his first book published 1995 is Emotional Intelligence, Why It Can Matter More Than IQ. I would like to also add uh, Mark Brackett's Permission to Feel. Mark and his team, uh, he's also the founding director of uh, the Center for Emotional Intelligence at Yale University. In his book, Permission to Feel, they have some framework there that are applied at schools now, like from the kids to the adult level learners. And uh, in terms of leadership, because Sarah also mentioned Brene Brown and um, teachers as leaders in school, I suggest you guys also read Brene Brown's Dare to Lead. I've learned a lot from that book, and I'm sure you would too. Our website, theenglishblog.com, and you'll find many interesting articles there and resources for you to teach the English language to all types of learners. You can find us all across social media. Uh, you're probably watching this video on Facebook right now. So you probably know our page is the English blog and the URL is the English blog for teachers. Uh, we're also on Instagram, the underscore English underscore blog. You can also find us on LinkedIn as the English blog as a company um, and as Twitter at the English blog one, the numeral one. Um, and then our videos also go up on YouTube after they come up on Facebook. So you can check us out across social media. Tell us what you think. Tell us about your experiences with EQ, good or bad. Uh, and let us know what you'd like to hear from us in the future. Yes, and as you watch this video, don't forget to share it. Share it with people so that they could learn also from what we have discussed today. All right, so there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, fellow lifelong learners. You have just learned emotional intelligence from the English blog team. My name is Adrian. And I'm Sarah. And don't forget to keep learning and keep practicing with your EQ. Stay healthy and happy. Bye, everyone. Bye.